Come on in, Severn. How we doing? Amen. Amen. A little bit of an energy about the building this morning. I don't know if you can tell. I could tell from the morning I, from the moment I stepped out the Jeep on the, uh, on the parking lot over there, somebody was screaming at me, good morning, pastor, from across the way. Because here's why, because here's why, in case you, you have noticed the same energy that I do, uh, a whole lot of people in our church family are stepping forward and declaring that they're standing on the finished work of Jesus in baptism. And I can tell you, I can tell you this, if you know anybody that was at the 9 a.m. service, it's going to be powerful, okay? And, and so let me, let, me, uh, let me get through what I got to get through, and we're going to end this series worshiping God uh, alongside our brothers and sisters as they hop on in that tank and get dunked. So my name's Ryan. I'm the pastor here, if you're, if you're here for the first time, specifically if you're the friends of the family of uh, any of our fine folks, brothers and sisters that are getting baptized, I'm going to welcome you. You have arrived smack dab at the end of this series. We are now in week 19 um, of our series from the book of 1 Corinthians called Undivided. I'm going to be in chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, so let me go ahead and read that. We'll get rolling, and we will celebrate that Jesus is still doing what Jesus said he would do 2,000 years ago. I'm fired up. I hope you are too. So we're in, uh, we're in chapter 15, 1 through 10. It says, now brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You are also saved by it if you hold to the message I proclaim to you unless you believed for no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received that Christ died. Man, if I could read this without smiling, I would be dead. Listen to this. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, the gospel. Whew, can you imagine? And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But here it is. But by God's grace, I am what I am. What a statement. We're going to sit on that for a minute or two this morning. And his grace toward me was not ineffective. However, I worked more than any of them, yet not I, but God's grace that was with me. This is God's word. Um, the two things that I try to pay really specific attention to when I'm teaching through a book of the Bible is how it starts and how it ends, opening words and final remarks. And this passage is really unique because what it represents is really the beginning of the end of the letter uh, known as 1 Corinthians. And so what you're reading here in these verses is what Paul, some 2,000 years ago, desired to be the final ideas ringing in the ears and in the hearts and in the minds and in the lives of these people that he loved. And he could not be more explicit about what he wanted to leave them off with. He says it right here in verse 1. I want to clarify for you the gospel. The gospel. So what is the gospel? First off, the word gospel literally means good news. And if you were reading this passage, uh, like someone in Paul's day some 2,000 years ago, in the Roman Empire, a gospel was a declaration of a history-altering event. Uh, it, it referred to something really big happening, like the coronation of a new king or, you know, the defeat of an invading army. It was, announcement, it was an announcement of news that was so powerful that it could literally change the trajectory of your life. And the gospel that Paul is referring to here and the gospel that we talk about every time we refer to it in the Christian belief system is this right here, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. That's the gospel right there. That's the news that literally changes everything. And hear me, the, the gospel, when we talk about it, it's not advice, it's not a suggestion, it's not a checklist, it's news of what someone else has done that can literally change everything about you. Now, I, you know, I think it's appropriate to say it's a little bit amazing that Paul decides to leave off here. It's a little bit amazing that this is the final thing, because if you've been here for this letter, 
You know how Paul began. I find it ironic. Paul began and chooses to end this letter in exactly the same way. He began it with the gospel, if you were here 19 weeks ago, and now he's doing the same thing and ending it. Because when he opened up in chapter one, I mean, the, the, the Corinthians are famous for being the most busted up group of believers in the entire New Testament churches. Nobody comes close to needing as much, you know, work and refinement and cleaning up as these people. You're not gonna find that in Philippians or Ephesians or anywhere else. But for all of the, uh, of the things that that they were getting wrong and the issues that they had, Paul got right, right out the gate. He got to the point in chapter one, verse 18 and pointed them to the gospel. And here he is leaving them off with the same thing that he started them off on. And what that should show you and I right out the gate is that the gospel does not just get us in the door of Christianity. It takes us all the way home. We never get beyond this message called the gospel. We never outgrow it. It should never get old. It should never be elementary because what it is, it's the central message of Christianity to which everything in the Bible is either looking forward to or back at. Now, the, the reason that that's important to, to kind of um, hang out for a moment on, on a Sunday morning is because if you ask people, what I've found personally is that the message of the Bible is incredibly misunderstood even by people who attend church their whole lives. And if you ask most people to kind of summarize, I've done this before, I'd encourage you to do it. Just ask people, hey, summarize the message of the Bible for me. What's the general message of Christianity? About nine times out of 10, what I hear from somebody is a list or a command or a, here's a th things you should do or should not do. You know, what's the message of the Bible? You should be loving, you should be kind, you should not steal, you should not kill. But hear me on this. If that's what you believe the message of this book is, you don't understand it. The central message of the Bible doesn't have anything to do with what you and I should or should not do. It's what Jesus did that we could never do. That's what this book is really written to show us. And so what I want to do this morning is exactly what Paul's heart's desire was 2,000 years ago. I just want to point us to the gospel. I want to remind us of why this is, this is the central message of Christianity, why this takes us all the way home, why this is the answer for whatever you're facing today, and why this message is such good news. And to answer this question of why the gospel is good news, I got a three-pointer for you. And the first answer to that question is, is my first idea today. Here's why this is good news, because Jesus meets us where we are. Yeah, everybody knows that hymn, Amazing Grace. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a moving song for so many people. It's a touching song for so many people. Here's the reason that grace amazes me. Here's why grace should amaze you and should never get stale to you. Because it's not a grace that you have to clean yourself up for. It's not a grace that you might experience if you arrive at a better version of yourself. It's a grace that meets sinners exactly where they are, exactly as they are. And if it didn't, then we're hopeless. And that's the first thing we see about this message because right after Paul reminds us of the resurrection of Jesus, he says this, this is just so profound to me that we mouse over this and forget this. Here's what Paul says Jesus did just after he was raised. It says, he appeared to people. The risen son of God did. And the very first person, you know, I, I was looking at this list all this week and I've, you know, I've, I've heard this before, I've read this before, but I've never thought about how significant it is that the word of God specifically tells us that the risen Messiah met with these people. Because the first person we read about Jesus meeting here is Cephas, which is another name for Peter. Here's why that, that means something to me, because the last interaction that Peter and Jesus had before Jesus went to the cross was Peter denying even knowing who Jesus was. You, you got to remember, in Jesus' day, it was an honor, it was a privilege to be discipled by a rabbi. I mean, children would line up for the honor. So rabbis were incredibly selective. You got one life to invest in people. You want to make sure that you're going to get as much bang for your buck as you can. So rabbis would look for very affluent families that could afford to, you know, pay for their children's education. They could read, they could write, they could, you know, communicate who they are and what they believe intelligently. Those are the kind of people that rabbis went after. So when Jesus circles the Sea of Galilee, pulling fishermen off their boats and investing his life in them, that's not something that any other rabbi in his right mind would do. But if you go back to Jesus' day, what you would expect to see happening is it should have been Jesus denying any affiliation with Peter to preserve his own reputation. But in this heartbreakingly ironic turn of events at the end of Jesus' life, it's the fishermen that denied knowing the rabbi. And still Jesus appeared to him. Just think about what that says about Jesus for a minute. After this, we're told not only did he, did he appear to Cephas, but then he appears to the 12. 
The 12 men that he invested his life in, his entire three and a half year ministry, these are the men that had the unthinkable privilege of walking in the footsteps of God. And Mark chapter 14, verse 50 says, not a single one of them stood by Jesus when it counted. When Judas led that midnight mob to Jesus with their swords and clubs and all that in hand, every single one of them deserted Jesus and still he came to them. Then we read that Jesus decides to appear to James. That's his half-brother. Not once in Jesus' earthly ministry did James acknowledge acknowledge Jesus' claim that he actually was the Son of God. Openly ridiculed. How ridiculous that that James' half-brother would say something like that. And yet, Jesus appeared to him. So here's what moved me as I'm reading this list this week of the people that Jesus specifically decided to make himself available to after his resurrection. Every one of them either denied him, deserted him, or doubted him. And these are the people that Jesus appears to. These are the people that Jesus meets where they are. And just to drive this point home even further, Paul gets explicit in verse 8. He says, last of all, as to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And what Paul is, is, is uh, walking us through there and opening up his life and his background, he's showing us not just that Jesus meets people where they are, he's showing us the kind of people that Jesus is willing to meet with and how far he's willing to go to get them. Because the first time that we're introduced to the author of this letter, who just calls him, called himself the least of the apostles, Paul, the first time we're introduced to him in the book of Acts, it's by his Roman name, Saul of Tarsus. And the very first time we see him, what he's doing is overseeing the first execution of the Christian church, a man named Stephen. And immediately after that, like a madman, he's entering the homes of Christian men and women, physically dragging them off to prison. So this is a, this is a religious terrorist, Saul of Tarsus is. This is the modern day equivalent of an up and coming leader in ISIS. He's already making orphans. He's already ruining lives. He's ravaging the church. And then in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, we read, Meanwhile, Saul was, just listen to how the Bible describes him. Saul was still breathing threats and murder. This is a maniac we're talking about. He's breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, which is what they used to call Christianity, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So this this religious terrorist is, is actually more passionate about stopping the spread of the gospel than most Christians are about actually spreading it. Because when he decides to go from Jerusalem to Damascus, that's not walking from Severn to Glen Burnie. That's that's walking from, that's walking 135 miles north. That's six days Paul's willing to go just to lock up a whole bunch more Christians and bring them back to either have them thrown in prison, tortured, or killed. And that's where Jesus decided to meet him. And, and, and see, the, the account of Paul's conversion, it's, a, it's full of theatrics. And I think sometimes, just because of who we are, we focus in on those theatrics. We focus in on the, the events surrounding Jesus' meeting with Paul because they're amazing. You know, there's this blinding light that only Paul can see that knocks him physically down and, and blinds him. And then there's this heavenly voice echoing from this light that reveals to Paul that this whole time he's been persecuting his Savior, Jesus, and how God needed to, you know, give a vision to a man named Ananias to preach the gospel to Paul. And once Paul heard it and responded to it, something like scale fell from his eyes. It's an incredible account, but what we have a tendency to mouse over is where Jesus specifically chose to meet that man, where physically and where in his life he was when Jesus met him. Because where Paul was, he was still breathing threats and murder against God's people. He was physically in the middle of a mission to murder more of God's people. Meaning Jesus met with Saul at a time in his life when he could not have been further from God. And what I love about this story, what I love about this account, the hope that it gives people like you and me, is Jesus did not demand that Paul get his life right before he appeared to him. Jesus didn't wait for Paul to start making amends for the life that he was living. He didn't wait for him to put any kind of real estate between him and who he was. He, grace met him where he stood. 
And the reason that Jesus operates this way, the reason that the word of God is so explicit in reminding us that Jesus operates this way is to show you and I 2,000 years later that there is no such thing as too far gone. There's no one that's beyond redemption. There's nobody that's out of Jesus' reach. And so, hey, you may have come to the house of God this morning being able to sympathize with the people that Jesus appeared to on this list. Maybe you've done something that you've really regretted, like Peter denying Jesus, or the disciples deserting Jesus, or James doubting Jesus. Or maybe you find yourself right now at a place in life where you're squarely in the middle of a mess that you know you've made. The good news is that Jesus has always been meeting people there ever since he's been meeting people. That's the first reason that this good news really is good news because it's for sinners. It's not for people who are polished, who are perfect, for haven't made mistakes. The only thing that you need when it comes to this gospel, the only thing you need is need. The only thing you need is nothing. That's the first reason that this message is good news. But it's not the only reason. Because in verse 10, Paul says this, He says, but by God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not ineffective. However, I worked more than any of them, yet not I, but God's grace that was with me. And so what he's walking us through is that, amen, it's an amazing truth that Jesus meets us where we are, but praise God, he doesn't leave any of us that way. And the second reason that this gospel really is good news is because Jesus doesn't just meet us where we are, but he changes who we are. And I, hey, I got to be honest with you. I, if, this, if this is the kind of thing that you're kind of like, yeah, you know, I've heard that before, nothing new. If this is the kind of thing that you just, that, you know, this, this, you yawn at this, you kind of just, you know, one of these. Now, I'm just going to be honest. You and I don't have a lot in common. I don't sympathize with you. I can't relate to you. You and I, we're not made of the same stuff. Because this right here is one of the most blessed promises in all of Scripture, that I don't need to be the husband that I've been. I don't have to be the father that I've been, the pastor that I've been, the person that I've been, that I can be more like Jesus and less like me, that this right here is not the finished product. Because I'm not, I'm not super pleased with who I am today. I, I still got a whole lot of sin in my life that I know, daggone well, I can't clean out by myself. So hearing that we don't have to be who we've been That's that's a promise worth holding on to. And when Paul says, by God's grace, I am not what I am, what he's saying is by God's grace, he's not who he used to be. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. So let's talk about what that does not mean. What that does not mean is that if you're in Christ, you're better than you used to be. Nope. That's really not that good news. You can still be, you can be a whole lot better as a person and still not very good as a person. You know, it's not like when you give your life to Jesus, you you know, now it's you plus six pack abs or now it's you plus a few less bad habits or you plus whatever or you minus whatever. What the Bible says, the hope that we hold on to is that when a soul collides with the risen son of God and yields itself before the risen son of God, our identity on a fundamental level has been altered forever and a new trajectory for our life has been set. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's what I think about that. Yeah, that's what that means. And so maybe you hear this and you're thinking, well, that's cool. So what does that look like that we actually are changed by Jesus? The man writing this, this letter, the man that God used to write this letter and 12 other books in the New Testament is the poster child for the change that Jesus provides. Because here's the story of Paul. He goes from hating Gentiles and killing Christians to preaching to Gentiles and caring for Christians. He used to be enough of a whack job that he gets 135 miles of cardio in trying to stop the spread of Christianity and enslave people. Now he's running throughout the Roman Empire trying to liberate those people with the gospel. Now he's running on at least three missionary journeys, getting whipped, getting beaten, getting thrown in the stocks, getting shipwrecked, having friends bail out on him, turn on him. He's, he's, you know, his boat's wrecking. He's bit by a snake. Guy got bit by a snake and he kept going. I mean, that's something. I'm going to talk to him about that when I meet him because that would have done it for Pastor Ryan. I love you all, but a snake would stand before me in the Great Commission, I'm afraid. It didn't stand before Paul. And so now this guy is feverishly loving these people to the point he loses his life. And so what you see in Paul's life is the kind of change that only Jesus can give you. It's internal, inside-out change. God changed Paul's heart, and he can change yours too. 
And now, let, me, let me say this. There's not a person in the world, I don't care if you're agnostic, atheist, Buddhist, Scientologist, if you're praying to Tom Cruise or what you're doing, you want the change that Jesus provides. We read about the fruit of the Spirit. Everybody wants the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, the whole nine. No one has ever come into my office and said, Pastor Ryan, you gotta help. I have so much joy and peace in my life, it's nauseating. I'm tired of going to bed with a smile on my face. Pray for some anxiety and worry. I need some pits in my stomach. They haven't heard that before, and I would send that demon-possessed person out to church. I don't have anything for you. I haven't heard anybody say, I'm so, you know, my family is so marked by the love that God provides. It's like an episode of Seventh Heaven. Could you pray for more fights? No, no. Everybody wants the change that Jesus provides, but this stupid game we play is where we try to circumvent Jesus to get it. Amen? And we try through works of our own hands to improve ourselves, to try to affect this change that only Jesus can provide. But here's the, here's the spoiler alert. You can't do anything about the bitterness in your heart. You know, you're bitter about things that have happened to you that you feel like you don't deserve. You're bitter that you haven't received things that you think you do deserve. That bitterness is toxic to you and you know it. And if you could just be done with it, you'd have done that by now. But you can't, you can't do anything about bitterness in your heart. You can't do anything about anger in your life. I don't know anybody that likes being angry. You can't do anything about your anxiety, about your worry, about your fear, about your doubt, about your self-centeredness and your arrogance and your pride and all the brokenness that that leads to. But Jesus can. Jesus can. Jesus can change your heart. Because what I see in the pages of this book is that murderers can become missionaries. And fishermen can become church fathers. And sinners can become sons and daughters of the God they rebelled against because Jesus changes who we are, church. Amen? Amen. Now that's good news, but I have even better news for you, church. And this leads me to the three-pointer. This is the doozy. All right, it was a one-two combo. Here comes the uppercut. Number three, Jesus delivers us from death. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, say that out loud without, you know, showing off the pearly whites. Can you just stop for a second? What if you believed that? What if that idea permeated every area of your life? You'd be pretty fun to be around. You'd be pretty cool. I was sitting on this this morning and asking God, God, would you make me believe this more than I believe it? You know, I sympathize with that Roman soldier. I believe, help my unbelief. That's the tension we're living with. But this is what the gospel tells us. See, everything that I've set up to this point in this sermon is fantastic, but it all has to do with this life. It's all about this life. Jesus meets us where we are in this life, changes who we are in this life. But let me be real blunt for a moment. We had, we had a membership class yesterday, and we, we, you know, we go around the room, and people talk about you know, what they like about Severn and why they're here, or whether or not they can't stand me. And one of the common themes I heard from, from the people that fill maroon chairs every seven days is that Pastor Ryan preaches a blunt message. I said, okay, roger that. You, know, I, you could say worse things about me. That's not the worst thing in the world. But in, 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 in the vein of my, my bluntness, let me just say this. You and I only have one problem in this life. We only have one. It's not the economy. It's not the job that we hate. It's not the in-laws that we can't get along with. It's not the fact that you've been cutting carbs and sugar and still don't have six-pack abs, even though those may be problems. The problem, the capital P problem that you and I have in this life is that this life is coming to an end. That, that what you and I and the milk in my refrigerator have in common is we all have an expiration date, only we don't even know when ours is. And all things considered, it's probably gonna be here sooner than we realize. So here's what that means. Here's what that means. Regardless of what somebody does for you and what somebody does for me, if they don't solve that problem, they have not helped us. But Jesus' salvation does not just change who we are in this life, it saves us in the next life. See, everything else that Paul deals with and walks through in the rest of 1 Corinthians 15 is really meant to deal with a wrong mindset, a wrong belief that the Corinthians had. These people started to doubt whether or not Jesus had really risen from the grave. So they started to doubt, well, maybe there won't be a resurrection for God's people. Maybe this life is all there is. Maybe Jesus' salvation really is just about now until my final breath, and that's the period at the end of the sentence, game over. And, and here's what I love about Paul. Paul was a blunt man. Paul got right to the point. In verse 19, he said, listen, if we've put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. 
And my heart screams amen to that. Because no matter how good this life is, it really isn't all that good, church. I mean, the best possible version of life on this side of eternity, this sin-stained world, still doesn't get the job done for me. And I know you can say amen to that. And what I need, I need to know that there's something that's gonna be so good one day that it's gonna outweigh how bad it can be now. Because there's too much loss, there's too much hurt, there's too much heartache, there's too much pain for this to be all there is. And in everything that Paul says after this, he is reminding us of the blessed hope that Jesus Christ is alive and well now and forever. And because death was not the end of the story for our Messiah, it will not be the end of the story for his people. And so Paul tells us this. What an amazing promise I'm about to read you. Listen to this in verse 55. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, outside of Jesus, if not for a champion that came forth and fought the enemy we had no power against, death does have victory over us. Death does have quite a sting for us. But because of Jesus, we have victory over death because he took the sting. And so the gospel, hey, listen to me. The gospel is not just that Jesus died so we can live. The gospel is that Jesus now lives so that you and I can face death free from fear. And now this thing that was once our greatest enemy is just a doorway we step through that ushers us into the presence of God, where we'll live as we're meant to live, where we'll be as we were made to be, and it's never going to end. Now, all I've done this morning is tell you what Jesus has done, talk about this good news that we call the gospel. So maybe maybe you're wondering, okay, well, what do I have to do? What's my role? The only thing that you have to do in light of this message, the only thing you can do is exactly what Paul said the Corinthians did at the beginning of chapter 15. You receive this message and you take your stand on this message. The gospel needs to go from something that you understand to something that you stand under. This is not a message that you hear and say, that's nice and walk away from. The gospel is not a message that you hear articulated, clap for at the end of a 30-minute sermon and then never think about again. This message should alter the way you go about life. This message should be what you stake your life on, what you take your stand on. And the only correct response is to yield to the God who became a man so that you could be saved. And you stop trying to be your own savior. You stop trying to be your own God and you trust in Jesus to secure your standing before your maker. For everyone who's willing to do that, regardless of what's brought you to today or what you're dealing with today, the promises in this chapter are yours in Jesus. And that's what we're gonna celebrate today in baptism. Today we celebrate that our brothers and sisters are declaring publicly that they are taking their stand on the finished work of Jesus. And with them we celebrate that Jesus has met them where they are. Jesus is changing who they are, and Jesus already has delivered them from death. It has no sting. It has no power. It has no, j- no victory because Jesus took it away. So know this, as we close today with one more song, watching our family get baptized, know this. These are not bad people that Jesus has made good. They're not immoral people that Jesus has made moral. They're not sick people that Jesus made healthy. They're dead people that Jesus has made alive. So on your feet, let's get on our feet. Let's worship God. Hey, Jesus said, the angels in heaven make noise when one sinner comes home. Let's rejoice. Let's sound like heaven when our brothers and sisters come out of that water. Amen? That's it. That's all.